All right, we are finishing up a series today, and we have been talking about what it means to be rich in God's eyes. And so each week we've had this moment where we all get to join in together, and it's been kind of a class participation thing, and this week is going to be no different. And part of the class participation stemmed from this week. Uh, we ordered some furniture, and on Friday it was being delivered to the house. And like, like any of us, whenever we set up an appointment, we're like, we'll be there sometime from when the sun goes up to when the sun goes down, most likely, right? You want, you give me a little more, you know, specific as far as it goes. And it's when that's happening, you're waiting and waiting for this call to come, so someone's going to show up. And I realized, you know what? I have a rich person problem. I have a rich person problem because I'm waiting for a couple guys to show up to my house to deliver furniture that we got. And there's countries all over the world that that would be completely foreign to them. What do you mean people actually make furniture? Do you go somewhere and buy furniture and then they put it in a truck and they bring it to your house and they'll, they call you on a, on a cell phone? They do all these things. This is rich person problem after rich person problem after rich person problem. So I'm going to prove this to you today, and I'm just going to start with me. I, I have a rich person problem. Uh, the person that does the announcements today, she was not able to be here. She sent me a text message this morning. And in the text message, it said, our water heater broke. I'm not going to be able to do the announcements today. You know what she has? She has a rich person problem. If I would have got that cell phone message, oh, my cell doesn't work. I don't get the message until later. I have a rich person problem. The fact that I have a, a smartphone. How many of you have ever gone to a store and you're like, oh my goodness, my phone is slowing down. It's not working as well. I need to get a new cell phone. You have a rich person problem, right? Don't you say this with me. I have a rich person problem. Ready? On three. One, two, three. I have a rich person problem. Okay, because we found out in the first week of our series that at the end of the day, basically, we're all rich. Our country, it doesn't matter what you make, we are richer than over 80% of the world, even if you're making just minimum wage. But if you get to the $40,000 mark, you are in the top 3% of everyone. And if you get to $50,000, you are in the top 2% of the entire world. So guess what? We are going to have rich person problems. So here we go. Let's start with the ladies. All right, ladies, here we go. Should I wear these brown boots, because it goes with this part of my shirt, should I wear these charcoal gray boots because it goes with this part of my shirt? Or should I wear these black boots because it goes with this part of my shirt? Ladies only. One, two, three. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> See, you just don't want to admit it. <laughs> this is part of the problem. We don't want to admit that. Okay, let's start. Come on, ladies. Don't discuss your women of faith and all that stuff. You want me to repeat it again? Brown boots. Charcoal gray boots or black boots? On three. One, two, three. I don't even know what you just said. I need more boots. I heard that. Anybody else hear that? Okay. Let's try this with the guys. All right. I don't know if I should buy the new hybrids or if I should buy the new irons. I'm not sure if I should buy a crossbow or a regular bow. I don't know if I should get an AR or an AK. All I know is that on one, two, three. Oh, <laughs> 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 I want to see Dan in this last participation. <laughs> okay. Who has a cell phone? Just admit if you have a cell phone, okay? Who's ever wanted to get upgrade the cell phone? Who's ever had a time to where you don't get the coverage that you want to get? Who's ever had a call drop off on them? Who doesn't have enough bars? <laughs> on three. <laughs> One, two, three. I have a <laughs> Okay, good. Let's go back to the ladies now. Here we go. <laughs> ladies, the seasons are changing. And so I was carrying this, this very bright colored purse because of the sun shining. But now the leaves are changing. And so now I have to decide between this earthy colored tone and a black colored tone for my purse to wear. And so what I realize is that one, two, three. I have a rich person problem. These are the best, aren't they? All right. Guys, you know what? We're coming up on that time of the year and that season. And I'm going to probably need to go with my little four-cylinder chugger to a four-wheel drive, something with a plow on the front. It's going to be really cool no matter where I drive. 
So I know that one, two, three. That's our issue. And we all have it. We all have time when we have a rich person problem. But many times we just don't want to admit to it. And so many times we have these dollars available, and sometimes we don't even have these dollars available. But we, what we've learned over, over these last few weeks is that, that money tends to control us. Now, is it a sin to have money? No. Is it, is it a sin to, uh, that God is, is blessing you in that way? No, absolutely. Do we sometimes look at other people and go, well, they're being blessed more, you know, and from a financial standpoint, and they must be doing more right according to God? No, that, that's, that's not the case. But what the case is that we want to learn, we want to understand that when it comes to giving, we don't want our riches to get us. And so the first week we talked about, we said, I'm not going to put my hope in riches, but to God who richly provides. Let's try that on three. One, two, three. I will not put my hope in riches, but in God who richly provides. Let's do it again like we mean it. One, two, three. I will not put my hope in riches, but to God who richly provides. First Timothy chapter 6. This is where this came from. This is a warning that Paul had to Timothy. And he said, listen, you've got to talk to the rich people. And it said in verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So see, you can have riches, and you can use those for your enjoyment, but we have to be careful as to how those riches command us. And so this is the week where it's going to get a little bit different on you. It's the final week, and I'm really hoping this is something you'll think about. And not only think about, but I'm challenging you right now to, to have this so that you live this every day. And it doesn't matter if you're 10, 20, 50, 80. Your age does not matter. If we get this turned around, if we start looking at this through God's eyes, and we start going in God's way, you will be amazed. You will be amazed at what God will do in your everyday life. Every relationship we have comes down to two things. Every single relationship. Finances and faithfulness. Finances and faithfulness. Something in there causes relationships to struggle when it comes to those two things. But Timothy, or I'm sorry, but Paul in this verse today, he says this right at the beginning. This is where it's a little bit different than anything you've probably heard from before. And he says this. Command those who are rich... In this present world, not to be arrogant. He knew that rich people would be arrogant. And for everyone here that knows a rich person, we know that that can be the case. And yet also, some of you know, maybe every one of you know, someone that is rich financially. And if you never know it. They drive a normal car. They live, in a, they live in a nice house, a decent house, all that kind of stuff. But they don't rest in all the stuff that they have. Instead... They look at ways that they can help people. Help people that may not be as fortunate. Do they still enjoy the riches God has given them? Absolutely. But their mindset isn't in those. Instead, it is in something different. And Paul tells us it in this verse. Command those who are rich in this present world. What does that mean? I mean, how many worlds are there? there? What world are we talking about here? He's saying right here in the here and now. Command those in this present, the rich in this present world to be here. Not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. So it comes down to what our willingness is and how we decide that we're going to share. Young people, I cannot stress this to you enough. If you get this right, if you get this right now, you will, you will have a life that is going to be stress-free for the most part. You're going to have issues at times that they, they take place. But if you can handle this side from the financial standpoint, then all you need to worry about then from that point is your faith. And focus on that faith because we don't want your money to get you. And it can happen. Your money can own you. It can possess you. It can take your mind to it every single time. And you have to be aware. So parents, if, if your kids aren't here, write this down for them. Grandparents, go and help your grandkids with this. But young people that are here, focus upon this. And if you make this change, and if you start off with this right from the get-go, you will be amazing at how you'll be seeing according to how God sees. Jesus shares a story. He's in Luke chapter 12. 
because he knew that there were a lot of rich people that were out there. And he understood that it would get them. He knew that the top, the top thing that was going to go against God, the top thing that was going to compete with God for your hearts and for your minds was not the devil, was not Satan, was not even necessarily sometimes sin. What it was going to be is yours and my finances. And when we focus upon those finances, the bottom line is we have a rich problem. So Luke, in Luke chapter 12, there's a discussion that's going on and people are asking questions in a mind that says, this is the parable of the rich fool. And it says that Jesus told this parable in verse 16. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. I have no place to store my crops. Meaning, he has a rich problem. I've got all this stuff, I've got all these crops that I have, and you know what? My thought is what? Where will I store all of my crops? He says, then he said, this is what I'll do. So he comes up with this great idea. He says, I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Wasn't that great? I mean, I've got these great big barns out here, and they're full of stuff. And I'll have all that, and I can just sit back, and I can just coast and live on it, and I'll be good to go. But before I do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear those down, and I'm going to build even bigger ones, and then I'm going to fill those up. Now, some of us can stop here and say, well, th there's nothing wrong with these barns. So why would you tear those barns down first? Why would you just build some extra barns? And then you have even more barns for people to see. Why would you tear those down and build bigger? This was this guy's mindset. In his mindset, he needed more, 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 newer, bigger, better. All those things that he had a major rich problem. And if we were to stop that for a second, we could tell our kids, hey, it's okay to have a savings account. It's okay to have a 401k. It's okay to have retirement. None of those things are wrong. The Old Testament teaches all of those things. But if every day our focus is around what's the stock market going and how much is this making? And what's my interest rate? And we get so consumed by it, we don't see God within those moments. And what's happened is we put the almighty dollar ahead of the almighty. So here's this guy with this major, major rich problem. He's had the same rich problems as we all have. I've got to make more. I've got to make it bigger. I've got to have more. It says in verse 20, but God said to him, you fool. You fool. He has not some words. He says, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, which is the next thing that happened, you will get what you have prepared for yourself. Then, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? So, last question. It's okay to have the riches. It's okay to have the savings. It's okay to have the 401k. All those things are good. But at the end of the day, if that's all you sorted up for, was so that you could put it in one barn and then get in a bigger barn and then another barn, another barn, and you die. How much of it do you get to keep? Nothing. It goes to someone else. And you don't even know who it goes to. Because you have estate planning, you have all these other kind of things, you have taxes, all the stuff that takes place. Oh, you know what? That guy didn't do his will right. So because he didn't do his will, we're going to take this amount. We're going to grab this much. This is going to be taken away. And all those huge barns, you had 10 huge barns up there. And when you're done, guess what? All the stuff that was in them, we took all of it. But you guys, get, you get to keep the barns. And all there's a bunch of empty barns. Well, that's not what I wanted when I was here on this earth. Well, guess what? You don't get that choice now. It's not your choice. Is it okay to save for your kids? Absolutely. Is it okay to try to even save for your grandkids? Absolutely. But if that's all we're focused on, where is God in that savings plan? He's not there. He's not there. And none of us know when the time will be that we're done here. We're finished. And so rich problem after rich problem possesses us and it owns us. Because that's the society in which we live. They sang the song, I am free, I am free. And every one of us are free. We live in this country where we have these freedoms. We have these freedoms to be able to invest. We have these freedoms where the money's coming in. We can do whatever it is that we want. Where is your money going? Because here's the bottom line. If you want to show me how close you are to the Lord, don't show me the good book. Show me your checkbook. 
Because too many times in the United States, and this is just the this is this is just the bare facts, truths, so glad you're sitting down for it. Givers do the SP giving. They give sparingly, so whatever I can kind of left. They give sporadically, hey, when something comes up, I give sparingly, I give sporadically, oh, and I'll give spontaneously. Because there was a hurricane, I'll send something down. And because of that, we found that we talked about this last week, so many of us give accidentally, and we give about a percentage of like 6%. Why is it then that we are not focusing on what we're giving on a regular basis? Because we give spread, because we give sparingly, because we give spontaneously. And because of that, those are the only times that we feel that release that we give to God. And here's the amazing thing about it. Every single time you gave something to help, gave something to help someone, you don't want that back, did you? I'm so glad I got to help the people, those hurricane victims. I'm so glad I got to help those people when there was an earthquake or when there was a typhoon. I'm so glad that I went on that short-term mission trip and we gave this and we helped with the medications. And every time there's a, a, a need, a, an opportunity and a need to give, and we give that, we feel great. And yet, we do it sparingly. We do it sporadically. We do it spontaneously. And because of that, we give our 6% by the end of the year, and we don't even realize we gave that 6%. Because we don't do it consistently. And remember this. The Almighty God is what's keeping us from the Almighty. And Jesus knew that. And he knew it was going to take place. And when that happens, we get so focused on building bigger and putting more away and doing all these things. If you'll notice, in all the things that he focused on, this guy here, it was all about himself. And God was nowhere to be seen in it. And so Jesus stopped and said, you need to pay attention consistently, almost religiously, <coughs> weekly, when it comes to your giving. Because as good as you feel when you give that away sporadically, spontaneously, or sparingly, you're going to feel that every time that you give to something that you know God's hands in. When I grew up, I was taught as far as by giving. I'm going to show you this here in just a little bit. We'll share about it. But I was taught the, the value and the importance of the local church. So for me, the local church is very, very important. So we give every single week to our local church. So if you guys want to know if, if, if I'm a giver, I don't look at who gives what. But I don't have any problem with anybody going back to the last eight years and seeing that I gave. Every single week or, because I know this happens as well, every other week or once a month, depending on when you get paid. And see, that's one of the things that's taken place that's stopped people from giving. It used to be that you get a paycheck every Friday. And then someone came in and said, hey, payroll, if you do it every two weeks, it's cheaper. But if you do it once a month, it's even cheaper, even though it costs you more from a tax standpoint. What that causes you to do is you only give once a month or twice a month. And because of that, you don't have the release that takes place. Now, is that wrong? No. If you're giving and you're giving according to what God wants you to do, it's absolutely, there's nothing wrong with it. We get it. We understand it. But that's just one of the ways that society steps in and takes you away so that you, instead of giving every single week, oh, I'm giving every other week or I'm giving once a month. And we don't have that release that takes place that says, I know this is going to help someone. And we need that because we start to see as God is seeing. Jesus continues and he says this. Let me start back in verse 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then, which is the next thing, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? We talked about that. Verse 21. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. In other words, for anyone that has a rich person problem. The competition out there for every part of us, for our hearts, for our minds, for our souls, for our everyday walk. It is intense. It's intense when we deal with non-believers and we just love to, God, can I just one time, I know that whole smiting thing, can I smite them just once? You ever felt that way? You know, even, I mean, you know, just, just one time, no one's really watching, can I just smack them upside the head? Can I just tell someone how stupid they are? Can I give them, can I put them down? If you've ever felt that way, just be honest with you, who's ever felt that just once? But then you stop, don't you? Who stopped? Throw your hands down. <laughs> Who didn't stop? I'll let, I'll let hang out with you later. Okay? All right. You can teach me how. Because, because you have to. There's not a whole lot that you can do. But you don't really have to, right? 
I mean, if you did it, you, you would feel, okay, I'll put a little bit of guilt about it later, and it will be God's eyes. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you're still going to love them. I'm going to prove this to you. Man, I hope this works. So the, the first one didn't that. <laughs> How many people yesterday noticed that Ohio State won? Okay. Ohio State plays Michigan last weekend of the year. And by the way, we have at least one Michigan fan here too, by the way. Okay, so let's be kind of this. So here's the deal. Would you, at the end of the day, if Michigan wins, would you still love that Michigan fan? Who's saying they would still love them? Oh, who, who, who wouldn't? Be honest with you. Okay, this is so great. This is like a TV show. My three sons came up. Okay, this is great. I want you to turn around. Turn around, turn around. I'm just going to pick someone out at random. All right? Uh, Gen Pod. Do you love Gen Pod? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, 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 Eric the Wood Guy. Do you love Eric the Wood Guy? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, he's angelic. Lisa Harold, you love Lisa Harold? If one of those three was a Michigan fan, would you still love them? No. <laughs> wait, wait, who said yeah? You did. You did, and Nathan didn't. Turn around, stand up. Would a Michigan fan please stand up? Lisa. <laughs> Be honest with me. How do you not love Lisa? Could you put away your hatred for Michigan because of your relationship with Lisa? Jake's still standing. <laughs> but see, that's just it. There's, there's always kind of something that gets in there. We've all got vices that kind of take place. But at the end of the day, her heart matters so much more than what it is that she roots for, what it is that she focuses upon. Our heart matters that much to God. So that those dollars that we have and those coins that we have, then each one of them, it's the last place that they says, in God we trust. Is that where you put your trust? Because it is, if it is a thing that we do, then we need to learn, we need to understand, yes, I am rich. And yes, I want to put my hope in God. And I want to do this not spontaneously, not sporadically, not sparingly. I want to do this so that each week, every opportunity I get, that I can give something that is going to help someone. For me, once again, when I was growing up, it was a local church. But here's the great thing that happened. Once again, not once but twice, $2.13 to our name. And Deanna brought this up to me after the first week. She goes, I don't even remember being at that place. She goes, I, I don't remember that. But we were there twice. I did, because I was one that got us there. It happens. You get your focus off of God. And I was giving God the leftovers. And here's the thing. Our financial situation has slowly changed over time because it naturally does. But it was just my focus on where I was giving it. And so we still give, obviously, to the local church. But then we've also, because we've changed our habits, we can give in other areas. There's a kid that needs to go to a camp. We can help out in that area. There's a Hope Outreach that needs a, you know, clothing up that we can help out in that area. There's a family that's struggling right now that might need groceries. We can help out in that area. And you can go and do it, and when you have that margin, you get to go help. And here's the great thing about it. You get to say, man, God, thank you so much for allowing me to be able to do this. You don't need to put it in headlines. We don't need to announce it. It doesn't have to go into Facebook, none of that kind of stuff. You have the margin, the opportunity to do so when you choose because... You learn to give God's way. And I'm going to just share this with you right now. There's something special about it. Because when those moments come up and you're consistently giving, then all of a sudden that spontaneous giving is on top of it. That sporadic giving is because hurricane season is only a couple months. And that sparing thing is, hey, I just happen to have this on me. I'm going to give this to you because I know it will help. And it's awesome. And you can enjoy all the things that you want to enjoy in any way that you want to enjoy. Because God has blessed you in that way to do so. Do not worry. Verse 22 says that Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, uh oh, what, what's that there for? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. How many people here are warriors? Okay, all the women. There we go. Well, you guys have a lot to deal with. I mean, do I wear the brown boots? The boots with this part. Let me go through that already. I'm sorry. I Go through my notes here. Here we go. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I will tell you, do not worry, I'm in so much trouble later, that what you eat or about your body, what you will wear, life is more than food and the body more than clothes. 
Consider the ravens. Do they not sow or reap? They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than the birds. <coughs> Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? That worry that we worry about always and then add an hour on later stops us. Whenever we have that worry, it stops us from doing and looking and acting the way that God intends us to. The worry takes over the love that we have in our heart for others and for caring for others. God's got it, but we've got to trust him enough. Consider, verse 27, how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, oh, you of little money? You of little dollars? You of many dollars? Faith. Oh, you of little faith. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Notice that? When you're seeking his kingdom, you're going to have the different things in there. He will provide those for you. You may not have a million dollars or five million dollars or whatever it is that you see in your mind that is going to be rich. But... When you start getting as God intends you to give, you start realizing that, hey, these are blessings that I get to give to other people and I get to help other people with. And yet, I've eaten every day. And I've been clothed every day. And I have a place to live every day. And I have a roof above my head. I, one of my sons came in today and he said, oh my goodness, last night someone turned our thermostat off. And it was 60 degrees in our house. He goes, why would somebody do that? And all I could think of was, you got a rich person problem. Right? And you've got a stupid roommate problem. That's the other part. Why would you turn off? They just turn off the heat completely to save a little bit on the back side. But once again, it's a rich person problem. And we all have them. It's up to us whether or not to recognize them, then admit to them, and then decide what we want to do about it. Not us personally, but according to what God teaches. And we worry, and we worry, and we worry. Let me share something with you. If the stock market crashes tomorrow, completely, by the way, it'll stop at 10%. It's a rule they put in ever since the Great Depression. But if it goes 10% tomorrow, and then 10% the next day, and then 10% the next day, it's not going to take very long before that 10% gets down really, really, really low, and everyone's freaking out. And then everyone is going to demand, where is my money? Where is my money? Where is my money? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten people right here. Okay, these ten. Lauren, I want you to stand up. Tamar, I want you to stand up. Carol, I want you to stand up. Oh, I picked three women. <clears throat> oh, that's good though, because that would have their boots and everything matched. All right, here we go. Of these ten people, the stock market crashes tomorrow. Those three people will get their money back. The rest of them won't. That's our faith in our own stock market. Thirty percent is all they're going to get their money back. That's it. Go ahead, have a seat. That's it. And yet we put our faith in that. And God is saying to us, listen, this is way bigger than dollars. This comes down to your relationship with me. These are the things that are going to take you away from me. And if God is going to be the most important thing, I'm going to supply everything you need daily. Because just like the rich man, you don't know when someone's coming calling and it's over. Hey, nice barns. You built bigger barns. You put more in it for you, for you, for you, for you. Is that how we want to be known? Is that how we want to live? Jesus finishes it up. Verse 32. It says, Do not be afraid. It's in her 365 times. A daily reminder. Little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Point out here for a second. God bless you. Selling your possessions doesn't mean you sell everything. He's going to provide for you. But if there are things that you have that you know can go to help people, can you give some of those away? Because there's something that takes place in it. People brought in trash bags of stuff today. And in some of those trash bags, there are things in there they don't even realize are in there. And then you go looking for them later and say, oh, I gave that to that whole bar range. I'm glad I did that. I didn't really need it. We have rich people problems. That's going to help someone else. And we know it does. It just stops us for a second and says, man, God, thank you. 
Sell your possessions, give them to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. So when you're putting things away, is it okay to have the savings 401k? Yes, we've already talked about that. Is it okay to have these things to, to say? Absolutely, not a problem. But when that becomes your God, you put it ahead of God. And you and I have a major rich person problem when that happens. And so here's the warning. We become arrogant. We've got to be careful. What are you storing up? Who is it you're helping? Where is your hope? Where is your hope migrating to? Because if you're going to be rich, and we're all going to be rich at some point, at some time, we want to be good at it. We want to be great at it. And these are the words that Jesus gives us. Four, verse 34, where your treasure is, it, there your heart will be also. So where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let me show you how this works. You ready? This is just what I've been taught. All right, this is, a, this is kind of a, a, a cool illustration. These are 10 $1 bills, I think. Three, five, ten, yeah, ten, okay? This is what I learned, and I knew this growing up, and I had to be reminded of it later. All right? John, I'm going to give you a chance to be God here for a second. You're welcome, all right? Here we go. I get $10. I already know that these three are going to go to the government. Those three right there. Who wants to be the government? <laughs> Everybody knows it's going to be the government. Oh, that's a terrible idea. All right? Well, here, hold on. I'm just going to I'll give your stuff here a little bit. All right. So, here we go. Ten of them. I already know this portion is going away. Right? And so many times, I give this away, and then I give out what's left. If I do that, if I already give this to the government, you have to give this back a little bit. Okay? Okay, there we go. So now I'm down to seven. So now I have to give 70 cents, right? Who did I put first? What? Out loud. Yeah, I want you to say it out loud. Okay, you all have a rich person problem. Give me that money back. All right, here we go. We all have it. It's okay. God says bring those first fruits. So here I have $10. I look like I'm rich right now, don't I? Right? Right? Make it rain? Okay, here we go. I've got these $10. All right? I already know these are going to the government. Okay, that's six centers for government over there. All right? I have 10 of these. I'm taking the first one, the first one, and giving it to God. I still got to pay these to the government. But look how many of these I have left. I mean, that doesn't seem like a big deal, right? Who would do that? Who would, who would take that first dollar? There we go. I'm going to give that to God. I already know I'm going to give the government. I still have all these left. Every young couple that I sit down with, I say, listen, challenge yourself to live on these. Or to live on these. Or to live on these right from the get-go. <laughs> And to save one of these. And then you get to choose whatever it is that you want to do with these. Too many times. Alright. 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 We live. And I need to bring four cents. We live on this plus four more cents. So we're four cents in the hole, right? Nope. Because the government's still taking the 30%. Now you're 34 cents in the hole. One third of everything that you have within the United States. This is just the national, this is just the averages. One third of everything you have, you live on that is not yours. How long will that take before this becomes your God? Oh my goodness, man, I gotta go to the mailbox and what's gonna be in there? Oh my goodness, I've got to pay this fee and oh, what was the minimum? Can I cover this and I can I do this? And oh, you know, we just added that and oh, we release this and, and it's on and on and on and it wears us out and it beats us up and we worry and we struggle. And God says this, hey, why don't you start giving my way? Why don't you start giving according to what I teach? I want you to be rich. And guess what? You are already rich. But here's the thing. You take this first thing and give. And you give this to the government. And then you live on this. And you get to choose whatever it is to do that you want. Whatever it is that you want to do with this. But sadly, that's not where our society is. 
We don't have this to choose what we want to give with it. And so when something comes up and that sporadic time, or man, I've been giving to the local church, and I've been helping out with missions locally, and I know that it's helping out in India, and it's helping out here in the community, and all that stuff is great, but man, I just don't have any left. I'd love to give that $5 for that, or $3 for that, or $2 for that. Toy for Treat that just took place here this past week, it was awesome because people brought bags of candy in. And they're like, hey, you know, all I can bring was just two bags of candy. I can't be there. Can you hand that candy out? And that's what we did. I don't know how much bags of candy are, but eight, ten, twelve dollars. You know why they're able to do that? Because they live in such a way that they're able to give according to the way that God wants them to give. They don't do it sporadically. They don't do it sparingly. They do it according to when God blesses them, and they do it every time consistently. <laughs> so she's like talking to her friend about how to spend this. Okay, so now here's the thing. I don't have these. This is pretty easy with a dollar, right? Who can do this? Be honest with me. You get ten of these. Okay, who can teach this to their kid? Okay, you can do a dime for the kid. So you take one, you put it away, right? Now, you ready? Who can do this if these were hundred dollar bills? Some of us can, right? If they're thousand dollar bills, a couple people get so woo. <laughs> you know, this is what money does to us. It gets a grip around us, and yet Jesus said it this way: "Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." So once that anxiousness build up, once it build up inside of you, and once you're thinking about, man, I, I can give a dollar out of ten. Probably do the hundred out of a thousand. Man, a thousand out of ten thousand, or ten thousand out of a hundred thousand. If you made a hundred thousand dollars in a week or a month, do you know what everyone would say around you? Man, I wish I had that because then, then I would give. Then, when I made that much, then I would give. And the answer to that whole thing is no, you wouldn't. You know why? Because you're not going now. Our, our society is not going to now. Tithe, T-I-T-H-E, the average church giver, on purpose gives the T to get 2%. That's it. That's it. And yet we have more families that we'd love to help out even more. And the more that we bring in, the more that we can help out because the first 10% of this church goes to our missions. So if we're bringing 1,000, we give 100. If we bring in 5,000, we give 500. There's never been a time where it's like, we've had the biggest offering ever. Maybe we should pull something back. No, nope, it goes to that every time. We want to be the same way in giving within the church as we are going to be personally. You know why? Because where our treasure is, that is where our heart is also. We still have cool stuff and great stuff and all that stuff. But where's your heart? Where's my heart? Back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Last verse. Give you a lot of verses there, I know that. Verse 19, chapter 6. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation. He's talking to the rich people. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And so what Timothy is saying to the rich people, what he's saying to, I'm sorry, what Paul is saying to the rich people, what he's saying to you and me, as there's a warning, your money will get you. It's going to get you. But if you can give God's way, and if you realize that God is the one that has blessed you so that you can give, do it consistently. Determine ahead of time that this is what you're going to live on. This is a percentage that you're going to give. Give yourself that margin so that you get to decide what you want to do with that margin. Realize, be honest with yourself that yes, I have a rich problem. But at the end of the day, I want to be the kind of giver with the kind of heart that puts all of the financial issues aside so I can focus on my faithfulness to God. Because I will not put my hope in riches. I will not put my hope in riches, but in God for riches and You buy your heads, please. We are finished with this financial series. I realize it's always tough when we talk about finances. But if you really think about it at the end of the day, 
Are we talking about finances or are we talking about our hearts? I want you to just talk with God a little bit, just the two of you. Is my focus upon you or is my focus upon my finances? This is where I have my anxiety. This is where I have my worry. This is where I have my doubts at time. And yet, just as your word said, you, you, you take care of me every single day. You provide. So where is it you can rest in God and say, God, you got all this anyway. I just want to trust you and I want to do it consistently. I am blessed and I'm thankful that I'm blessed. And Lord, I want to rest in those riches that you richly provide. I want to rest, I'm sorry, I don't want to rest in those riches that you provide. I want to rest in you because you richly provide. So take a couple minutes and then we'll have, uh, Mike's going to ask you all to stand and we'll get up and sing together in this final invitation.